I was born in Wisner, Louisiana, in a small uh, hospital. It was called uh, Rosa, Rosa Maria, I think it was. It's in Wisner, Louisiana. My family's from Wisner, Louisiana, basically. My mom is, uh, my father's from Sicily Island, Louisiana, which is about nine miles south of Wisner. Mom had began to work at a bar. And eventually they bought that bar. They bought that bar, I think in 1955, they bought that bar. Uh, I truly grew up in a bar. Uh, and my parents ran that bar for 58 years uh, until my mom's death. First school I went to, it was uh, kindergarten. And back then, kindergarten was not mandatory. Uh, but my mom put, and I was first child, my older brother did not go to kindergarten. I did it. It was at the American Legion Hall, they had a kindergarten for black children. But in the first grade, I went to uh, Lincoln Elementary, which was the neighborhood African American and black school during that time. I went to that uh, Lincoln Elementary from the first grade through the sixth grade. And then in the sixth grade, uh, the seventh grade, I went to uh, Carroll Junior High School. I find myself in a class with uh, most of the kids had failed. Most of the kids were much older than I was. And there were only two of us who were actually supposed to be in that seventh grade class, uh, Rosemary Bassett and myself. And really interesting, and I look back over my life, and I think it was destined for me to be a teacher because during that time, the teachers saw that we were out of place. And instead of moving us back into the class we should have been, they used us as kind of mentors for the students who've been there for quite some time and to kind of tutor those kids. And uh, that was my first, uh, my, my first opportunity, uh, my first, uh, I guess, foray at teaching. Uh, when I was 12 years old. And I tell to people all the time, I've been teaching since I was 12. In my high school year, they closed Carroll. They closed Carroll and made Carroll a ninth grade center. And uh, making Carroll a ninth grade center, what they did, they took us, the, the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, and they dispersed us into the white schools, and so we were bust. Never was the traditional school on the north side where all the money was. And so they were very selective about who they sent to Neville. Uh, and they, they, they kind of, I don't know how they, did this, uh, how they did the cut, but I was sent to Neville. One of the things that we wanted to do, and we'd always celebrated all of our lives, was black history. And during that time, it was a black history day. Now we have a black history month. But we had a black history day. And always on the black history day, there was a program a program that celebrated the, uh, the pioneers and the heroes, if I can call them, of, uh, of, of black history. Uh, went to the principal and asked him, and I think his name was Dr. Smith at that time, and he would meet with us. He would not meet with us to talk about having a black history program. Kept putting us off, kept putting us off. Uh, and then finally decided that we were gonna walk out of school. We were gonna walk out, we were gonna march, and march back to Carroll. Uh, I did march, I did not march back to Carroll. And let me explain why ULM chose me. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd been to Gremlin once to visit when I was in high school, and that was when I think I was in the 10th grade at Carroll. They took us to Gremlin. Uh, but my parents knew nothing about college. I knew nothing about college. I lived less than a half of a mile from ULM. ULM was directly across the track, and it was prohibited grounds. For, I'd never been to uh, uh, Northeast uh, before registering at Northeast uh, because the track divided the black neighborhood from the white neighborhood and Northeast was located in the white neighborhood and there was some and that line was somewhat a line of demarcation and uh, I, I passed by Northeast uh, but I'd never been on the campus until uh, it was time to uh, time to go to college my parents knew nothing about registering us, for, uh, registering me for college. They knew nothing about how to get me in, and so the guidance counsel at uh, at uh, Neville helped me go work through the process, get the go through the process, uh, get the scholarships, get the grants, uh, and all of those things. When I got to Northeast, uh, I went the summer because I wanted to get an early start. And what I did, I took courses which I thought would be easy for me. To get, a, uh, to get that start that, that I needed at, uh, at Northeast. And so I took math courses. I was always good in math. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do, I wanted a good GPA going into the fall semester. And so I took three math courses, I made all A's. And so, and then I took a bowling class also. Uh, and so going into the fall semester at a 4.0. And I'd always had known that I 
wanted to go to law school, even though I was encouraged to do engineering and those things, but I always wanted to go to law school. Growing up in the 60s, growing up during the time of civil rights, being able to see the Martin Luther King, uh, seeing the pictures of Martin Luther King and everything that happened. I remember the day that King was shot. Uh, we were out, we were playing ball, and we came home at 6 o'clock, and Walter Cunkright was on the news, and my mom was standing there at the ironing board, and she was crying. And, you know, and trying to figure out what was going on, and she said, King has been shot. And so we spent all evening just sitting there before the television, watching the, uh, watching the events as they, as they transpired on news. But uh, all of that kind of made me want to be a lawyer. And some things that happened also during my early, uh, early in my life, but uh, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a change agent. I wanted to make a change. I wanted to make things better. Uh, and Revis Artig told us that we could. And uh, he was very convincing, very, very convincing. And so after that, I applied to law school. Married my wife May 18th, 1975. Uh, we got married. Uh, and I moved my family in 1977, May 1977, to Baton Rouge. I got into Baton Rouge, and at that time in Baton Rouge, nobody had an evening law program. And so I'm struggling trying to figure out, now how am I gonna navigate this? How am I gonna work? And how am I going to take care of my family and reach my, my lifeline, lifetime goal of becoming a lawyer? I was a low man on the totem pole in the job. I was a switching equipment technician. I was a low man on the totem pole. Nobody wanted to work nights. So I've, I was blessed to have to go nights. They thought they were forcing me, but I wanted to work nights because I wanted to go to law school. And so I registered for law school the moment I got the night shift. I got the night shift and I registered for law school. Really interesting. I started, work started at 4 to 12. Uh, and so I was able to go to, uh, go to law school and to work. And because of that, I was focused. I was focused and because of the family and because of the fact I was working, I was able to put things and structure things and put them in the right places. And I did well. When I graduated, there was a job offer that I got uh, with, um, with Judge uh, Jeanette Terry No on the Third Circuit. Uh, that was the first job offer I got. And I got that job offer through, again, uh, Dean Barry, uh, Louis Barry Alexander. He had worked on a campaign. Uh, he and uh, Peace Tory Spencer had also worked on a campaign, Peace Spencer Tory, I'm sorry, and they recommended me for the job, and so I got the job with her. It was one of the best experiences I could ever had. I clerked with her for six months. After clerking with her for six months, uh, they had a reduction in force uh, with the Third Circuit, and so each, um, each judge lost a clerk. And in doing that, she says, uh, I, I can't hold, keep you on as a clerk, but if you want to work with my husband, in the law firm, I've made a two-year commitment to you that we're gonna main, uh, keep our two-year commitment, which she didn't have to do, but she did. And so I went to work for her husband's law firm, uh, uh, Nolan Associates, one of the best moves I could have ever made in my life. I learned a lot from Mr. Eddie Noel. Uh, I learned a lot from Mr. Eddie Noel. Uh, and w the reason I learned a lot was that he kind of put me out there and he said, do it. Uh, but once I had problems, he would always be there to help me work through the problems. Uh, after that, I came back home, uh, couldn't get my wife to move to Marksville, Louisiana. Nobody knew of Marksville back in 1984. Uh, so uh, we came back home, and with, because of Mr. No's uh, relationship with, with the governor then, uh, Edwin Edwards, I was able to get a job here at the legislature. Uh, I got a job as a legislative attorney. Uh, and at the same time, I came back and uh, George Guillory and Alfred uh, Williams had set up a firm and they were looking for someone to come into their firm for the purposes of doing some of the work that they had because Alfred basically did personal injury and George was at that time probably the biggest African American real estate lawyer uh, in East Baton Rouge Parish. And so, but they had a, a lot of other things because they'd taken on collection contracts and so forth and they asked me if I would come in as a partner. Uh, I came in as a partner, but truly I was an associate uh, because everything they didn't want to do it kind of fell upon me. 
I got a call from Dean Agnihotra at Southern University Law School. He asked me if I wanted to teach, and I told him no. I didn't know enough. I hadn't been out there long enough, and so I, I, teaching would probably not fit me. And so I left his office, and then three days later, Dean Agnihotra had a secretary to call me again. Uh, Ms. Burris, Helen Burris, and I told Ms. Helen Burris, I've already told him no, that I can't accept the job. And then what I did too, I went in and I talked, at this time when I was at the legislature, C.J. Blotch was there, a, a big time lobbyist. C.J. Blotch was there, Leo Hamilton was there, uh, Guillory was there, Joe Guillory was there, uh, and they were doing well, they were doing, and really C.J. told me, he said, Ross, this is a place where things happen. He said, the legislature is the place where things happen. He said, if you want to make moves, he said, you might want to consider staying in the legislature. And so, uh, kind of listening to the CJ, I told uh, Dean Agnihotra no. Uh, Dean Agnihotra called me a third time. And I went in, he said, come in to see me. And I came and I saw uh, Dean Agnihotra. And I said, Dean, I don't know enough. I'm not ready. He said, Jones, I know you don't know anything but you got a special skill, a special quality that we're looking for, and I think you can help our faculty. Will you come teach? And looking the man face, and face, uh, face to face, and looking at his face, I could not say no. And so I took probably about a $15 cut in pay and <laughs> took a job at the law school, uh, which is the best move I've ever made in my life. My first 10 years of working, uh, I worked with the CLEO program, that's the Council on Legal Education Opportunity. Uh, for 10 years, and I taught in that program for 10 years. Uh, and it, it was really interesting, I taught one year, then after that each year they would call me back to teach. And I ran that program for Southern University on two occasions. Uh, we brought that program in and we brought students in uh, to that Clio program. Uh, besides doing that, I also became Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs. I've been uh, chairperson of many committees, I think probably all the committees there, I've probably been a chairperson of at one time or another over 35 years. I've taught 17 courses while I've been there. But now at this particular point, I uh, specialize in evidence, criminal law, and criminal procedure. One of the greatest things, one of the most historical events that happened at Southern University Law Center was at one time, uh, back in 1981-82, there was a uh, decree that came down and Southern University was supposed to merge with LSU University uh, Law Center. Uh, and that was one of the most, the, the greatest events and most significant event. Uh, and it was, I just love the way Dean Agnihotra handled that and the way that he rallied the troops in order to show the significance of Southern University Law Center, the significance of a historically black institution, and that if we got, if, if that institution was to go away, how much this state would lose and how much Southern University Law Center provided to this state. The Marshall Brennan Project is a high school project that we do a collaboration with high schools within the city. And what we do, we take kids, and most of these kids are from what I would call urban areas or inner city, I would say, uh, or from neighborhoods that are not doing that well. And these kids, we would take and we give them opportunities to show their skills in oral advocacy. We give them opportunities to show their skills in critical thinking. And it's really interesting to see these kids grow. It's really good to see these kids believe in themselves. I was selected, uh, 2010 it was, Best Professor of the Year, uh, Distinguished Professor. It's all because of my students. I've got the Hall of Fame Award from the Southern University Law Center. It's all because of my students. Three weeks ago, a resolution was done on my, on my behalf because of the work that I've done at the law school, the work that I've done in the law center. It's all because of my students. I learned so much from my students. My students have really changed my life more than anything else. Anything that I can say as far as the, my, 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 my career, anything I've been involved with, has been my students. One of the greatest things that I've done has been with uh, Southern University uh, Laboratory School, where for seven years I coached their mock trial team. And uh, in those seven years, we won the mock trial competition uh, when it was dominated by other schools. Uh, and I took three teams to the national, uh, national competition, uh, not the national, I'm sorry, the state competition for uh, the uh, Louisiana State Bar Association from Southern University Laboratory School. I don't allow awards, I don't allow uh, those accomplishments to define me because there's always something else to do. There's always another hurdle to cross. Uh, those are great. Those awards are great. Uh, it's, it's great when people recognize you, but more so for me as a teacher, seeing my students do well, seeing my students uh, going out and coming back and saying, Prof, 
I understand what you were trying to do. I would like to be remembered. And that, 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 that's really difficult for me because I think what defines uh, how you're going to be remembered is how you live your life. And I, I, I would love for someone to, when they look back at my life, they look back at what I've done at the law center, they look back at what I've done, I'd like for them to remember me as someone who tried, someone who cared, someone who wouldn't give up, someone who pushed people to try to reach their best, to try to reach their ultimate, someone who would not accept mediocrity.